taking your time to, to listen to me. I was asked to speak a little bit about the uh, German, Germany's role in, in, in Europe today. And it's evidently true that there has been uh, some major changes occurring in the last uh, couple of years concerning the role of Germany. Uh, my proposal was uh, to taking up a, a title of The Economist, Germany as a reluctant hegemon in Europe, question mark. Uh, and I hopefully can make the argument that Germany does not want to be a hegemon, not even a reluctant one uh, in, in, in Europe. But of course, it has a, a major role to play in European politics. And it's just right at the moment thinking about how this role uh, will be. Now, uh, the new importance of Germany in, the, in, in Europe is linked, I think, to some elements that are structural and some elements that are temporary and that will go away again in the future. I mean, um, it's clear that the Eurozone crisis has given a specific weight to Germany, the greatest economy of the Eurozone, to the opinion that are held in Berlin um, on the future of the Eurozone. And then, of course, we have at the same time the extra, an, a moment of extraordinary weakness of other major European countries. Uh, the United Kingdom is turning kind of inwards in a certain sense under Cameron. That was our impression. It's turning away from the European Union in a certain sense with the perspective of an in-out referendum in 2017. Uh, France is in a moment of extreme political weakness if you look at the capacities to, uh, of, of um, Manuel Valls and François Hollande uh, to influence politics. Even in its own country, there is but also outside of, of, uh, um, of France. I mean, the, the relative weight of France is uh, rather specifically low at the moment inside the, this equilibrium of forces inside the European Union. And you have similar problems, economic problems in Spain. You have a, a very deep crisis in Italy. So I think the relative strength of Germany has to be seen that it's also due to the fact that the traditional partners of Germany in the Europe European Union are uh, at a specifically uh, at a specific moment where their weight is relatively lesser than it used to be, and it will be again in the future, of course. So it's a, a temporary thing in a certain sense, I think. Uh, and then, of course, we have the new troubles, geopolitical troubles in the East, uh, Ukraine, uh, specifically, which of course turns Germany, gives Germany a, a new centrality in the geopolitical. Uh, landscape of Europe. It's the foremost eastern big country in the European Union besides of, of Poland. And so it, and because of its economic weight in that area in Eastern Europe, it is of course a, a, a major actor in the resolution of that crisis, which again adds to the impression that Germany is some kind of hegemonic force in the European Union. And then uh, there's the, the element of change perception by other major countries, the United States, because of the relative weakness of the other countries and because also of the relative weakness of the European institution, the Commission under Barroso have been looking around where is there something like a functional political partner in Europe. And they all turn to Germany, the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans. So I think these are some kind of temporary elements that add to the impression that there is a, some kind of hegemonic situation of Germany in Europe. But the interesting, real interesting thing about it is, is that Germany at the moment is a very specific moment of its own history. And it's totally out of tune with the mood of the rest of the continent. Now, you have a reluctant hegemon, which is in a totally different situation than most of its major uh, partners. And that's, the, I think, the, the interesting constellation of the moment, in a certain sense. We have growth in Germany, much higher growth than many other countries in the Eurozone. We have sinking unemployment, which of course is extraordinary for a country in the Eurozone. We have a very low youth un unemployment. If you compare that to Spain, where you have 60% youth unemployment in Andalusia, or to Italy, where you have, again, 60% youth unemployment in southern Italy, you see that there's a tremendous difference. We have a stable budget situation. We are looking forward to attain the black zero, the, uh, uh, a budget a stable um, a no deficit uh, budget in the in the coming years you have booming consumer spending uh, in opposition to the rest of the continent and if we look at the opinion poll there's the socio economic panel 
which measures uh, also psychological dimensions of well-being in the German population since the end of the 1960s. Never ever Germans felt as well as today. The, uh, the life satisfaction has never been so high in Germany as it is today. Now that, of course, if you would make a similar opinion poll in Italy or in Spain or in Portugal, you would have, of course, tremendous, and in France, which is at the brink of chronic depression, I think. Uh, it's, it would be, of course, a completely different thing. And that's the interesting thing. I mean, we are, Germany is in a very specific moment of its history, and um, it stands out among the European countries. And the interesting thing is that Germany, it's my interpretation, for the first time in the last 100 years, this country is at ease with itself. And that's a major date, if you're saying, this, this Germany that has not been at ease with itself always had been a big problem for its neighbors, and for itself, of course. And, but for the first time, uh, for my personal interpretation, uh, this country is at ease with itself. And I will just give you a, an idea of the depths of the divisions and conflict that this conflict-ridden country has had in the last six years, not to talk about the part before the Second World War. But if you remember, we had the division of the country. We had a loss of a quarter of the territory after 1945. There had been 12 million displaced per people that had to be integrated into the German society after the Second World War. The Iron Curtain was running right through the middle of the country, creating extremely militarized borders where Germans were aiming at Germans, uh, where there was a massive amount of tactical nuclear weapons stationed there. Uh, and of course, this east-west divide also had its effect on the internal political climate in Western Germany and led to total oppression of opposition in, in the dictatorship of the GDR. And then we had linked to the Second World War this very, up to my opinion, the strongest of all conflicts of post-war Germany, the generational conflict between uh, the generation of the perpetrators and the generation of the later born, uh, which still is a very strong and defining element, I think, of, of German po uh, politics today, which led to a very politicized student movement in 1968 with a lot of internal conflict in the society and also linked to the terror of the uh, Rote Armee Fraktion and the relatively strong muscle and, up to my opinion, disproportionate reaction of the state in some elements to, to that threat, which was in reality a bunch of middle-class children with light arms, uh, uh, which was not really something that was endangering the stability of the German society. But you, you had a, a, a climate of, uh, the, it was called in Germany the Bleierne Zeit in the 70s, where people really felt a bit uh, that the, the, the political climate was uh, very heavy. Now, in the 1970s and 80s, you had the upcoming eco ecological movement, a very deep di divide inside German society about the future of nuclear energy and about the future of the industrial society, which was more which was a much deeper running conflict than in many other countries uh, in Europe. Uh, you had a lot of demonstration, we had massive demonstration against nuclear uh, power plants in Brockdorf, in Wackersdorf, we had the demonstration against the Startbahn West, the runway at the Frankfurt Airport, which mobilized 100,000 of people. And it was really a, an element that was a political status identifier in a certain sense inside German society. Are you pro or, or against uh, nuclear power? Are you a green one or not a green one? <laughs> And then we had the peace movement of the 1970s and 80s against the deployment of uh, tactical nuclear missiles and cruise missiles, Pershing II, uh, by NATO in reaction to the deployment of uh, SS-20 uh, mid-range missiles by the Soviet Union, which again was a deeply divisive thing. And we had again 100,000 people, 500,000 people marching in Bonn against deployment. That again was creating a, a, a very strong uh, internal social divide and in, in political divide in the society. And both of these movements led to a restructuration of the political party system with the creation of the Green Party and the, entering the parliament. And then we had 1990s reunification uh, which was a wonderful thing, but very quickly led to another kind of division between the Wessies and the Aussies, because it came, of course, with tremendous costs on both, costs on both sides. Um, and if you look at the figures, the GDR was nominally the 10th industrial country on Earth in 1990, by whatever trick of the statistics, but nevertheless, it has a tremendous manufacturing, had a tremendous manufacturing base. This manufacturing industry of the GDR was totally wiped out in the five years after reunification. 
Uh, between 1990 and 1995, 80% of German, East Germans lost their job, either temporarily or permanently. And that's a tremendous upheaval of a society. And this also came with a high psychological cost because reunification meant also a devaluation of social capital, of cultural capital, of a whole biography in a certain sense, of, of, a, of a whole population. Um, and the financial and costs in, to Western Germany were, of course, also quite high. I mean, uh, there are different estimates, just to give you an idea, about the cost of reunification. It stands between 1.3 or 2 trillion euro today. Uh, and every day, due to social transfers to, from West to the East, uh, 100 billion euro is adding every year to the, to the bill. So it has been a tremendous effort of the Western part of the country to, to uh, help the Eastern part to, to modernize and to come up to living standards at least acceptable after the destruction of the economic base of the country. And then we had, of course, the, two, the, 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 the years of the Hartz reform, which again divided society quite strongly. Um, in the mid 2000 that was a context where Germany was seen as a segment of Europe. We remember all the, the, this debate about the future of Germany. Unemployment was at record levels of, of the Second World War. And um, these market and labor market reforms, and so welfare reforms, of course, were seen by many people again as a kind of devaluation of their professional biography, their contribution to the welfare system. And it created an, another political dynamic which led to the and that, again, to a restructuration of the political party system with Die Linke entering the Bundestag. And for the time being, I would say that the Linke will stay in the Bundestag because they have a relatively solid base in the, in the East. So the, the, this country wasn't really at ease with itself, uh, itself after, for a very long period uh, after the Second World War. And now it looks all miraculously gone. It, it's a far away thing. Uh, this Germany of today is totally different. The reunification is digested. We have with Joachim Gauck and Angela Merkel, two former Aussies as the two leading politicians. Uh, in Germany, nobody cares. It's just not a thing. Nobody really gives a about it. Uh, if you look at the economic and social situation, due to that tremendous investment that has been made by the West in the East, we have today in per, uh, per capita income purchasing power adjusted of roughly 90% in the eastern part of Germany, of Western German levels. Now, that's, of course, that's okay. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, really something that the living conditions are no longer much different between the east and the west. So it's also in the daily life of the people, it's, it's totally digested. Nobody asks any longer, are you from the west or from the east? It's a factor that is has become irrelevant. And then, of course, the economy is stable, unemployment is sinking. We are the export world champions, and that's always a source of pride for Germans. And, um, and I think also Germans have found a new positive form of identification with their country. They see it, if you look at opinion polls, as a country where it's good to live. Now, it's a, a threatened paradise, as one market researcher has formulated it. Uh, and they see themselves also as a force of good uh, for, for in Europe and in the world. That's extraordinary. Germans, because of the experience of the Second World War, never saw themselves as something as a force of good. Uh, and now there's a much, this kind of mild patriotism that has been sprung up, I think, in 2006 with the uh, uh, European Soccer Championship. For, for the first time, people put out German flags without being seen as closet Nazis or things like that. Uh, and I think the, this mood of a relaxed patriotism, uh, which is embedded in a, in a strong pro-European feeling, is, uh, um, would really describe the mood of Germany today. And uh, of course, there's positive feedback from the outside world. There's the sense of respect that people think Germany gets from the outside world. And there's this wonderful opinion poll by the B BBC, according to which Germany is the most popular country in the world. We would not have thought so. But uh, it was, of course, good to read it. <laughs> um, now, OK, the question is, how, how, do you, how, how stable is the current situation? But that's the interesting thing. I think if you look at the uh, decisive factors economy, economically, I think it's more sound that many people have, uh, and, and sustainable that many people have sought. We always had doubts about the sustainability of this export-led growth model that has established itself in Germany after really about in the last 15 years. 
But uh, it's thing, I think I have the impression that it really continues to function, and it's due to the fact that Germany has established itself uh, quite intelligently in the midst of the globalized economy, where the center of dynamic, of course, is shifting to the emerging markets. But Germany, is, with its exports in manufacturing goods, equipment, et cetera, is very well placed to profit for the time being um, for even a longer period of a reshaping of the world economy where billions of people in reality are just entering the industrial age in Asia and in Latin America. And uh, as one German manager has formulated it already 10 years ago, saying China will of course become the factory of the world, but it will be the Germans who build it. And in that perspective, there is, I think, for this kind of economic model that Germany has developed in the last two decades, there's still a, a, a solid base. And then, of course, we have this uh, weak demographics in Germany. We have a very low birth rate, which leads to sinking unemployment, uh, which is a good thing, of course, psychologically. Um, we, uh, uh, the, the, the labor market situation will be, for young people, quite good in the decades to come, which, of course, is an important factor for people to feel okay. They don't have generational worries about what's going to happen to my children. And if we don't have too massive immigration uh, to Germany, the, the labor market situation will be excellent for, for, for a very long time. And then, of course, German corporations and small and medium enterprises are extremely strong at the technological and financial level. They have lots of money stashed away. Uh, they are they're investing massively in research and development, and there are many hidden champions among the smaller enterprises in the world market. Uh, if you look at the European the EU Innovation Index, you will see that Germany is among the leading countries and among the great countries, the bigger countries, are the leading one. So also the, the technological base of the German export model seems to be very strong. Politically, the country seems extremely sta stable. We, this great coalition we have at the moment is the perfect political expression of this pacified mood of the German population, who doesn't wish to have major strife and conflict uh, in the political area. They don't feel that there's a necessity for that. And in reality, we have an old party government in Germany. If you take together the various levels of governance in Germany, from the federal level to the regional level and the local level, all parties are in some kind of coalition government with each other. Um, we, you, there is n no outsider in the political system in the end. All at to a certain degree, all of the parties in the Bundestag are involved in governmental and administrative functions. It's the country in, taken as a, in it together, it's run by all party government, which again expresses quite well this pacified mood of the German society. And then there's no major cultural or social conflict to be seen. Uh, I mean, you, you, of course, you've heard about Pegida and all these things. I think even the immigration question is, is most probably the most difficult one. Uh, with the long, in, in the long run, the most problematic potential at the moment is not an issue because the labor market is functioning quite well. There has been no terror attacks like in France or in the United Kingdom. So even that question is a tricky one. Uh, seems uh, to, to be, uh, at the moment, not a very, very difficult one for the German society. Now, um, what does this mean for uh, Germany's partner in Europe? Um, now, it's clear that we are living in a changing environment in that sense. Um, and the German political elite is well aware that it has to change its modus operandi in a certain sense. Germany's political elite, or Germany's modus operandi in the post -war, Second World War area was punching below her weight in a certain sense. Uh, that was the trade community. Uh, and that period is gone, it's about to go away. And uh, I think in, in Berlin there's a high degree of awareness that this is about to happen, that Germany has to reconsider its role in the European Union and as an, a responsible medium power, as Volker Pertus, uh, the director of the Inter German Institute for International Studies recently called it, as a responsible middle power in, the, in world politics, um, that we have to uh, assume new responsibilities, and the debate about these new responsibilities in full swing in reality inside uh, the 
political elite in Germany. We have the review process of the Ministry of Foreign Relations for trying to redefine define the role of Germany in, the, in foreign policy in the next decade. Uh, you have the Weisbuch process, a white book about defense, uh, which is to be drafted by the Ministry of Defense in the coming two years. And there, of course, it's all about searching uh, the role of Germany in this shifting and ever more turbulent world that is actually uh, emerging. Of course, we have a major debate how to manage Russia. Uh, the, the whole, I think, model of our relationship with Russia, which was based off of the idea of complementarity between this resources rich country, big country in the east, and the technology rich country in the west, and they have energy and we need energy. That was a, that was a kind of idea of complementarity between the two countries, and that has all gone down the drain in the last 18 months, I think, in a certain sense. And there's a huge amount of insecurity in German foreign policy elites and also in the economic elite how to, <coughs> how to deal uh, with Russia and how to establish a stable peace order which in, must in the end include Russia uh, in Europe. So nobody really knows how to deal with that, but it's a, a factor that inspires, of course, a more intense debate about Germany's role than in the past. Um, and then we have, uh, of course, a growing insecurity in the German political elite how to best manage the European destiny of Germany. I think the European destiny of Germany was one of the fundamental underlying concept that has been guiding German policy since 1945. And much of that master plan for the future of Germany in Europe, uh, not much of it, but part of it have become under question in the last two, three years. There is growing EU skepticism in, expressed in public opinion polls, uh, evidently also in Germany. And there are objective, clear, objective economic and fiscal problems inside the Eurozone. And there's no, yet no clear plan how to manage these problems of the construction of the Eurozone. And the economic effects of the Euro, the Euro has on the weaker economies inside the Eurozone. The problems of France are evident, the problems of Spain are evident. The problems of Italy are evident. It's not only Greece and its kind of over indebtedness. The real problem for the Eurozone will be what's going to happen to France, what's going to happen to Italy, what's going to happen to Spain, which are major industrial forces and they're losing strengths in the Eurozone because they have lost the very economic base of their, uh, of their productive model, which was based on devaluation of their currency over the last decade. Uh, now, linked to that is um, the problem that Germany is not willing to be the paymaster of Europe. Now, we want to be, to, 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 we want to manage this European destiny of Germany, but we want, on the other side, Germans don't want to assume the role of being the paymaster of Europe. That's also very clearly expressed in opinion polls. And if you look, for example, at the, at the coalition treaty, how he, the coalition treaty of the Grand Coalition frames the problems of the Eurozone. It's always framed as a problem of the others. Uh, they have a lack of competitivity. They have to deal with that. Uh, that's the only way to get out of this uh, situation of crisis. And there's not so much in the coalition treaty in the sense that Germany will uh, pay a, a higher contribution to the <laughs> consolidation of these problems. So there's a massive insistence on structural reforms uh, and not on Germany being willing to enter into a logic of a transfer union, or to be much more willing to enter into the logic of a transfer union. Of course, there's a certain willingness to sustain, to help transformation processes in the weaker countries, but it clearly comes with some, some limits in the understanding of the German population, also the political class. But there is still politically a willingness of massive further transfer of sovereignty, at least at the elite level. It's not at the population level, but at the elite level, I would say. One of, the Free Evil Foundation not only has this type of external bureaus, but we have also massive civic education programs inside Germany where our colleagues have in a daily contact with just ordinary citizens. And debating about Europe, one of my college, colleagues who is responsible for the internal education thing, she summarized her experience at the seminars of FAS in Germany on the European Union and problems in the Eurozone. She said, the, 
if you, if you look at Germany today, the elite is afraid for Europe and the population is afraid of Europe. And um, so that's uh, at the moment a little bit the situation and this puts limit to what Germany can do uh, in financial and terms uh, to stabilize situation in, in other countries. So uh, what are the challenges for this pacified Germany reluctant hegemon? They're essentially European up to my opinion. Um, and the elephant in the room is of course economic. Um, Germany is clearly over-dependent on export. It's, the economic model of Germany is sustainable thanks to the growth uh, of the emerging markets or the outside European economy. But uh, still it's over-dependent on exports. <coughs> the share of exports in GDP rose from 24% in 1991 to 46% today. I mean, in Ireland, this is not so impressive, I think. The figure, um, I would assume that you have an even higher proportion of exports to GDP. But for a, such a big economy as Germany, it's a tremendous figure, in reality. Uh, and also, in, if you look at jobs, 24% of the jobs depend on exports, compared to 17% in the mid-1990s. So there's a real trend that Germany becomes ever more dependent on exports. And uh, it... Since the introduction of the euro, it turned out to be also something like a beggar thy neighbor policy within uh, the European Union, because a big part of the German export surpluses is the result of intra European trade. Uh, if you really count the figures, um, uh, if the accumulated export surplus of Germany since the introduction of the euro from 2000 to 2013 in the inter European trade is one point. 74 trillion euro. That's a lot of money. That's jobs not created in Spain, Italy, France, etc., uh, but created in Germany at the worth of 1.74 trillion euros. And I th economically, this might be sustainable, but politically, it's not sustainable. You cannot live in this kind of interdependency like the European Union with having that kind of beggar thy neighbor policy economically. I think that will not be sustainable in the long run. And it's amazing to see to what degree the German political and economic elite refuses to discuss the issue. Um, I, whenever I ask a question to ministers or le uh, journalists or leading managers, it's not a problem, it's not a topic. That's really, I, I think, but they may be right economically, but they are not right politically. The European Union will not survive to s eternally, let's say, to that kind of policies. I'm quite convinced. Now, at the same time, we have a relatively low domestic demand. We have 20 years of wage restraint in Germany, and we have a massive redistribution from income from, the, uh, from income of work to capital uh, income. So that has led to a, a quite flat domestic market, which hopefully will be redynamized a little bit by the legal minimum wage that has been introduced uh, uh, now. But it's, uh, of course, a problem for our neighbors and our inputs could be much higher if we had a higher domestic demand in Germany. And we have the question of relatively low public investments in Germany, but it's relative, I'd say. But still, uh, Germany could do most probably a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Uh, to dynamize uh, also the European economy. So I think that will, are the, the real economic challenge for Germany to how to, to, to get the problem solved, I don't know. Uh, now, my conclusions for today. About a week ago, I received an invitation for a Clausewitz Strategiegespräch on Bismarck's 200th birthday. Uh, <laughs> Now, that rang, of course, any type of alarm bell in my head. When, in 1990, when reunification came, I'm from the south, from Munich, uh, uh, we were not so sure what to make out of this reunification. We were deeply afraid that with reunification, all the ghosts of Prussian uh, great power ambitions, anti-slavism, authoritarianism, might step out of the cupboards where the GDR had locked them in, uh, or out of their graves whatsoever. So, and now it turned out to be a much more friendly country, this reunified Germany that we were afraid as young men and women in, in 1990. Uh, and the German pu 
public opinion is extremely pacifist and anti-militaristic if you look at any kind of opinion polls. Um, so uh, I think even the Clausewitz Strategiegespräche will not lead to kind of militaristic interpretation of the future of Germany. But it's interesting, nevertheless, that things like that exist and then there's a kind of reassessment of the role of Bismarck currently in the public debate. Uh, former Chancellor Schröder has made an interview in the Spiegel where he tries to reinterpret uh, in a social democratic way the role of Bismarck, which is quite interesting as an intellectual exercise. But well, he did it. <laughs> uh, but and so we are at the moment also, I think, in, at, at the, in, a, in the midst of a generational uh, change, which leads to some open question marks, I think. Uh, historic guilt for the tremendous crimes of the Second World War and the Nazi regime was the central motivator of German politics till today. And it is waning, the sense of historic guilt, just for biographical, biological reasons. The younger generation, we, we are now at the beginning of a new area where the generation Schröder, Merkel, is, which is not, has not been so strongly influenced by that feeling as a generation that has grown up in a country that is a normal member of the world community, respected and well seen even by, by, by its neighbors, that will take over the control of the country in the, in the next 10 years. Um, and it will be interesting to see what this would mean for Germany's role, and would, especially what this would mean for for Germany's role inside the European Union, because the European destiny, this strong wish to shed the historic, torn identity of a German national or nation, and to be reborn as good Europeans, was a very strong element psychologically in the political motivations <coughs> of two generations of post-war, or three generations of post-war political leaders in Germany. And this will, I, I'm quite sure this will become bigger. On the other side, the younger people, it's my impression, are much more open, much more pro-European psychologically. Uh, they, the generation Erasmus, they have studied abroad. They are used to travel freely inside Eastern and Western Europe. Germany is in the midst between these two worlds. They, they know Eastern Germany quite well compared, for example, to Spanish or French uh, young people. So they will be pro-European. The question is, how will they interpret it, this pro-Europeanness in, in, in the decades to come? Um, but I think in the end, uh, um, it will be a rather peaceful country uh, at ease with itself and at ease with its neighbor that is about to take shape in, Germany, in the midst of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you.